I'd like to introduce Ken Myers, our uh, pr president, uh, to uh, welcome Laura. Well, thanks, Tom. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to our friends in Europe and around the world. Uh, my name is Ken Myers. I am the president of CRDF Global. And welcome to CRDF Global's Thought Leadership Panel on Nuclear Security, co-hosted uh, by the Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI. On behalf of CRDF, CRDF Global and our CEO, Mike Dignam, thank you for joining us. We are pleased to host this important discussion. CRDF has a long history supporting the nuclear security community. Today, we partner with government partners and organizations like NTI on initiatives spanning nonproliferation, global health security, and much more. We are thrilled to host this event with NTI and honored to have the opportunity to hear remarks from Ambassador Laura Holgate. I've had the pleasure of working closely with Laura during her time at Harvard, the Pentagon, at the White House during the Obama administration, and cheering her on as our ambassador to UN organizations in Vienna. So Laura, thank you very much for joining us today. And without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Tom uh, to get the ball rolling. Tom, thanks so much. Thank you, Ken. Thanks so much. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Laura Holgate. My name is Tom Callahan. I am the uh, Vice President for Strategy uh, Innovation and Evaluation at CRDF Global. And we are, um, uh, we are very grateful for, uh, to all of our colleagues, partners, and guests today. A couple of housekeeping notes very quickly. Today's session is on the record and will be recorded. If members of the media want clarifications or have follow-up questions, please contact Laura directly at NTI or Ashley Truxton at CRDF Global. Taking advantage of this virtual format, you may insert questions into the chat as they occur to you. My colleague, Neil Sugoran, will field them and may consolidate those with overlapping themes. Now to our guest. Ambassador Laura Holgate is one of those rare and extraordinary people who work tirelessly, often behind the scenes and out of public view, to head off catastrophic problems before they occur. She has devoted her professional career to studying the complex dynamics of international security issues and finding creative, sustainable solutions to thorny problems and threats. As Vice President for Materials Risk Management at NTI, she seeks to reduce the quantities and enhance the security of nuclear and radiological materials around the world, strengthening global security architecture and promote, promoting cooperation between the United States and key partners on nuclear and radiological security. Previously, she served as US representative to the Vienna Office of the United Stations and the International Atomic Energy Agency from July 2016 to 2017. As many on this call know, the IAEA is an essential institution with 18 delegations from key countries it is a challenging environment that requires patience, fortitude, expertise, and relationship building, a role ideally suited to Laura's talents. While in Vienna, and in addition to her other demanding duties, she laid the groundwork for the creation of the Vienna chapter of the International Gender Champions. And later she brought that concept back to the United States with the establishment of Gender Champions in Nuclear Policy, a group CRDF Global has joined and is honored to support. The path that led a young woman from Kansas City, Kansas to Vienna, passed through Princeton and MIT, service in the Department of Defense, first as special assistant to people like Ash Carter when, she, when he was Assistant Secretary of International Security Policy, and then special coordinator for cooperative threat reduction. There she was part of the formation and oversight of the, the non-Luger legislation and the formation of our own CRDF Global. She went on to serve in the Department of Energy and then joined NTI in 2001 for her first stint there. There, by the way, she brought to execution the extraordinary pro Project Vincha, an exercise in three-dimensional chess that removed 45 kilos of highly enriched uranium from a vulnerable location in Serbia. In 2009, she was appointed to the National Security Council staff as Senior Director for Weapons of Mass Destruction, Terrorism, and Threat Reduction. And during this time, she was the designated US representative, or Sherpa, 
for the preparation of all of the nuclear security summits. And she led the president's global health security agenda. Just recently, uh, NTI loaned Laura to the White House for a 60-day strategic planning assignment to feed proposals and recommendations into the policy process around nuclear and radiological security. And Laura, I believe uh, Ernie Moniz is still waiting for his thank you note from Jake Sullivan for uh, the loan. And as if all of that were not impressive enough, and I'm probably skipping things that would, you know, for other people would be the highlight of their bio. Uh, as if all that were not impressive enough, Laura told me yesterday that she has adopted and loved over the years, no fewer than eight retired racing greyhounds, which uh, as my colleagues know is, uh, as a, I'm a huge dog lover and it just, uh, it marries the, uh, the, the a, a big heart with an impressive intellect. Uh, so Laura, on behalf of, uh, of CRDF Global and all of our guests, please uh, welcome. Thank you for being here and uh, 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 please uh, share with us some opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, Tom. And that really is one of the more gracious uh, introductions I've had. Thank you uh, for the wonderful chat we had yesterday uh, and uh, for including me in, in today's event. I'm, I'm sorry that my good friend Randy Beatty isn't also able to be here. Uh, you might have, might see a little more sparks between <laughs> between us than if it's just me, uh, but I, I really appreciate the chance to, to speak this morning. And I thought it would be helpful just to, you know, put some pieces on the table uh, to really stick with this theme of the growing uh, need for nuclear energy and what that means for concerns about proliferation and nuclear security uh, at the global level. And so I, what, what I think we really need to focus on is how do we break the link between nuclear energy and proliferation? And the, these are, you know, have long been intertwined, um, the history of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. And this leads to the legitimate proliferation concerns about the spread of nuclear energy. But it also believe, leads to behavior and beliefs regarding nuclear energy that may not be fully explained by energy security rationales. And so if we think about Saudi Arabia as kind of the one of the examples that people think about is where nuclear energy might 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 be expanded to. You know, it, it's it makes a lot of sense for Saudi Arabia to think about using you know replacing oil for electricity generation, which is what they do now, and desalination, and replace that with nuclear energy. That makes economic sense. That makes climate sense. Um, it makes sense in terms of you know saving oil resources for purposes that they are that they are the only thing that can support. But it's also true that Saudi officials tend to frame their interest in nuclear energy as a counter to Iran's historical quest, historically questionable peaceful intent for their own nuclear energy. So that's a reminder that sometimes a nuclear power plant isn't just a nuclear power plant. So how do we like unpack that and create more distance between weapons and and energy? So there are two essential proliferation risks associated with nuclear energy. The first has to do uh, with the uh, di di potential diversion by a nation state of nuclear energy knowledge or materials or facilities to make nuclear weapons. So this is, uh, so, so taking from an energy, a peaceful use, which, which is guaranteed to them under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and secretly or covertly uh, diverting that to a weapons program. And so this is, the preventing this is really the primary purpose of the universal commitment added in the Non-Proliferation Treaty not to acquire nuclear weapons. And then the focus of the IAEA safeguard system uh, applied to the NPT signatories, except for the five recognized weapon states. So that's the first, first connection is diversion by a state from a, a, an energy program to a weapons program. The second potential is that knowledge and or materials could be acquired from, a weapon, from an energy program um, by insiders or terrorists or unauthorized actors and used to manufacture an improvised nuclear, 
an imp improvised nuclear device, uh, or in other words, something with nuclear yield. So these are the two main paths. Uh, since the dawn of the nuclear age, uh, there have been various approaches to managing these risks through international and national governance mechanisms. Um, these have succeeded in spreading and limiting the spread of nuclear weapons to a remarkable and to some surprising degree. Uh, today, we, there's over 450 nuclear power plants around the world and over 200 smaller research reactors in operation, but only four countries have been added to the original five holders of nuclear weapons uh, since the NPT uh, was created. And John F. Kennedy famously expected there to be 20 or more nuclear weapons powers uh, in the world uh, by now. The role of the NPT and the associated IAEA safeguards in achieving this outcome cannot be overstated. Of the additional four countries who gained nuclear weapons, three of them never signed the NPT and the fourth has left it. So that's, it's clear that for those who are part of the NPT system, it's working to prevent the proliferation that it was designed to do. The foundational requirements for preventing the spread of nuclear energy from further spreading nuclear weapons are therefore the preservation and strengthening of the NPT and the evolution of the IAEA safeguard system to anticipate new technological developments in both nuclear energy and verification. The NPT is currently under enormous strain and those who are looking to expand nuclear energy as a necessary element of reducing climate change, and this is true for all five of the NPT weapon states, the, it must ask, they must ask swiftly to preserve the treaty. Without the NPT and the robust verification that accompanies it, the only fire breaks between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons are one, the complexities of nuclear weapons related nuclear technologies, which are hard, but not hard enough, and the self-interest of those who've masters those technologies to hold on to them and not spread them further. Those are pretty weak fire breaks, unfortunately. Um, and so this is a real, this is a real challenge. My hope is that the, what, what may be as much as a two year delay in the review conference for the NPT has given an opportunity uh, for the five uh, permanent five members, uh, the five uh, um, legal holders of nuclear weapons to do better in terms of showing progress towards meeting their NPT commitments for disarmament. Uh, that is a critical component of strengthening the NPT. The, um, when it comes to, to governing nuclear energy, the, I mentioned the IAEA or the equivalent Euratom safeguards that are applied inside Europe um, are, have uh, create uh, constraints and confirm non-diversion uh, for materials. And the nuclear suppliers group has agreed to a voluntary criteria-based approach to exporting enrichment and reprocessing technology. Um, and so that's, that's a, uh, a technology constraint, uh, voluntary, not as strong, not as verified as the uh, IAEA uh, is able to do, but still uh, an important component of uh, maintaining these, these key technologies um, within the, the realm of those who who've historically had them. And among the states that are within the NPT, only Iran and North Korea completed their development of fuel cycle capabilities clandestinely while inside the treaty and the non-NPT states either stole or indigenously developed their fuel cycle technology. So there, no NPT state has knowingly sold fuel cycle technology to a state that did not already possess it. So this is another example of where the NPT and the nuclear suppliers group systems are functioning currently. But these need to be strengthened and expanded. And especially when we think about um, the new technologies that are coming forward in advanced reactors. Now, the, if we're gonna see nuclear energy expand um, to play a meaningful role in mitigating climate change, not only are we gonna to have to see these 450 mostly large gigawatt scale power reactors preserved and in some cases replaced, 
but we're gonna need to see uh, energy that is currently created by fossil fuels replaced with nuclear power. And we're gonna need to see countries that are looking to improve their development uh, through uh, you know, uh, managing or reducing their energy poverty, um, that we're going to want to see those new entrants into the energy market or the energy production also looking at, at new types of nuclear energy. And so for the fourth generation of nuclear uh, power plants that we're talking about now, some of them are small, some of them are modular, many of them use a different fuel cycle that is um, uses different kinds of material that may be more amenable to making nuclear weapons than the current 5% enriched uh, light water reactor fleet that powers most of nuclear power in the world today. Um, and they're gonna be deployed in new places. And so these tools, whether it's the IAEA safeguard system, whether it's the nuclear suppliers group, whether it's other mechanisms around nuclear security, whether it's the um, nuclear the global marketplace for nuclear fuel cycle, these all will need to adapt to effectively manage the risks of these new reactor types as they make it out into the world. And so that's uh, something that, that NTI has been working on. We partnered with the World Institute of Nuclear Security, which I, I know is another key partner of CRDF to develop a, a report uh, focusing on security by design for these new reactors. And that's what's exciting about where we are right now is when you think about the, the nuclear power plants that are, you know, the 450 that are spread throughout the world, most of them were designed before 9-11 uh, before uh, and bef before some of the other nuclear security concerns that, that have come out. And so when nuclear security measures, when these sites are upgraded to deal with modern nuclear security concerns, it tends to be glued on <laughs> to the outside, uh, you know, and it, it, it's not something that's part of the, how the reactor was designed. These reactors now, you know, we know that they, what they can, uh, that, that they can be designed to incorporate the uh, security that will prevent the, these materials from being stolen or misused or diverted. And so these are, um, we have a chance to do it right with this set of reactors and doing it right means doing it cheaper. Um, and it also means um, getting, you know, once they get out into the world that they are less likely to contribute to a nuclear weapons outcome. So I uh, hopefully have put a few interesting tidbits on the table there. Uh, happy to have you follow up on any of those, Tom, and to hear from the community out there about how do we grow nuclear energy without also growing nuclear weapons. I managed to mute myself. Yay, 200 people. Uh, um, Thank you so much. You have definitely um, uh, offered uh, some interesting things to come back to. Um, and I will further prime the pump by just asking, a, take, taking a few um, questions uh, up front that I would love you to hit on. Um, first, in our workshops and engagements, you know, around the world with partner nations, uh, you know, we we are engaging with sovereign nations, nations that have a sovereign, a right to make their own decisions about, and they are taking into consideration, just as we do, uh, all kinds of questions from security to market dynamics to political questions and so forth. And what, you know, when I, in the introduction, when I referred to you know, Vincia as three-dimensional chess, and you know, you could also put the um, the 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 uh, the fuel bank in that category. You know, you've taken and you've had the experience of that marriage and intersection between market dynamics, sovereignty issues, security issues, changing political dynamics, changing state you know stability, and you know, through both government and private sector, you know 
machinations and organization and ideas and working with people of goodwill from all over the place, you've found some solutions. Um, what, you know, when you talk about the new technologies, um, modular reactors and, you know, and different fuel cycles and so forth, there's a big market dynamic there. And people are making decisions about nuclear energy, which has all the advantages of low carbon footprint and all that things, you know, based on, you know, attractive, sometimes build own operate models, you know, we'll take care of that for you. What do you do with a potential energy consumer, you know, that best help them analyze the risks and reward on their own terms for their own country in a way that contributes to our overall uh, security and risk reduction, risk management posture? Well, it's an incredibly complicated topic that a lot of different groups are working on. And I know CRDF is working in that area in particular. Um, the uh, IAEA has mapped out a series of um, uh, wrote a um, milestone, they, they call it the milestones approach um, for countries that are looking to get into nuclear energy, you know, for the first time. And looking at, I think there's something like 14 steps along the path uh, that include things like clarifying what the, what the needs are from a volume point of view, but also from a distribution point of view. Are they looking for baseload power? Are they looking for fill-in power to pair with renewables? Are they looking for desalination? Are they looking for process heat um, that might be used in an industrial context? And so understanding what the, what the energy applications are is one of the first steps. And then thinking about to what degree nuclear is a contribution to that. What's exciting about these new ideas, the, these, this new generation of nuclear power plants is that they're good for a lot of a lot more diverse things than they used to be. Um, you know, a big gigawatt scale uh, nuclear reactor is pretty much good for baseload power, and that's about it. It's expensive and complicated to turn it on and off to match, say, solar or wind and fill in um, between that. Uh, the large uh, environmental exclusion zones that they have or make it difficult to pair them with an industrial site uh, to, buy, to provide process heat. These smaller ones have those potential. And so that's, that's so one, thing one is figure out, well, what do you need the energy for? What is, you know, what are the opportunities there? You also then need to think about governance issues uh, and about the, um, the human capital that's, that's associated with this. And this is not just like who's gonna run the power plant, who's gonna sit in the control room and turn the switches, who's gonna you know, work with the fuel to move it in and out or whatever. This is the, the intellectual knowledge of who's gonna be in the energy ministry making decisions. Uh, what, how knowledgeable are they about nuclear energy from a policy as well as a technical perspective. It means looking at the regulators uh, and are they ready to, to make high quality uh, regulations and uh, that, that will protect uh, this, both the safety and the security of new nuclear energy. Um, you, and you need to think about the, um, the training that will be required for security people uh, that will be, whether it's a private security force or whether it's a government security force, different groups do it, you know, different countries do it different ways. How do you uh, train them to the uniqueness of nuclear uh, energy as, or a nuclear facility as something that needs to be guarded? Um, how do you make, how, how do you train the rest of the nuclear, uh, the rest of the security community to be ready to play their role in preventing and interdicting nuclear smuggling, uh, radiation detection at borders, uh, all of the other pieces that come with being a responsible nuclear uh, user. And here we have a lot of trees um, that countries should be ratifying and signing up to. Uh, the Convention on Physical Protection for Nuclear Materials and particularly its 2005 amendment, which entered into force, um, is the only global binding uh, source of nuclear security uh, commitments and the, there, it has no verification mechanism, unfortunately, but it does create expectations 
for how countries are going to manage their nuclear materials and nuclear facilities and how the, the transportation of that material will be secured uh, between uh, within and, and between countries. So the there's a, a lot of this that, that can be the topic of international cooperation and the US government plays a role at almost every one of these uh, every one of these steps. And then private sector is also involved either in executing uh, government programs or in creating connections themselves. And so this is a, um, there, there's a, a well-worn path. Well, I won't say it's a well-worn path, but a clear path uh, that is that is not fast <laughs> and it's not cheap. And so I think part of that recognizing, you know, what are the um, what are the attributes of a responsible nuclear energy user uh, mm -hmm. and, and owner are really uh, critical components of a, of a decision that a country would make uh, to pursue. Something you said reminded me of um, one, you know, one example of the, the tireless and behind the scenes work, um, the Nuclear Threat Initiative Index the security index, um, which NTI puts out every couple of years, you know, and just keeping track of which treaties have countries signed up to. And, um, you know, having that, that is a, I think you referred to it in a, in a recent interview as, a, as kind of a Bible. Those kinds of indexes are really important for not only, you know, getting a snapshot of where uh, countries are across a range of uh, analysis, but also what the trend lines are. Um, is there anything about that process that, you know, is, um, you know, uh, any indications that are concerning? I noted that the last, the last NTI index, the title was, uh, was something about uh, uh, losing focus in a disordered world, you know, assuming the world will continue to be disordered. How do we regain that focus? Well, it's really a matter of political focus. And, you know, I, I've been now involved or, you know, connected or engaged in one way or another with all five of the NTI nuclear security indices. The first four were generated while I was still in government and I was a consumer of that information. And also uh, one of the steps of the uh, of the process that NTI undertakes is validation by government of the of the findings that they've discovered from public sources. And so I was also the the entry point for NTI's validation efforts for the the first uh, three or four indices. For this last index, I got to be, you know, in the back, <laughs> look at all the mechanics that sit behind it. And oh my gosh, it is an incredibly rigorous, complicated, impressive process that, that goes on uh, to create those numbers and the insights uh, that come from them. And the, um, but it's, it's such an important tool for countries themselves to see where they stand. Um, you know, there are some, you know, countries that are at the top of the list always want to like hang on to their you know, high score um, countries that are maybe regional rivals are always looking at how the other one does. And then, you know, their press reactions when these come out tend to reflect, well, you know, we did better than our neighbor. Um, and then, so there's a lot of, uh, of bragging rights that come with this. We saw during the nuclear security summits that the leaders, when they spoke about, when they gave their statements about nuclear security, they would often, those who are scored highly or who had done, you know, particular had 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 significantly improved in the index, included that as a talking point in their speech. Uh, that that was something that they took as a validation of their work. So what? So that's you know, it's a tool for governments. And this year we ex we did it. We made an even more explicit mechanism on the website um, of ntiindex.org. Uh, there is a uh, when you go to a the, when you view a country, uh, a country scores, there's also a section that we call the scenario section that says, if you, if you did these three things, your score would improve by this. And so we literally give countries a roadmap to how to improve their score. Uh, and, you know, in principle, how to, how to improve the nuclear security capacity and, and that they have. So 
that's um, one, one, one purpose of it is, is helping governments do better. Another purpose of it uh, that I used it for in, when I was at the White House is also to help uh, stimulate assistance and cooperation. I was able, when I would sit down with another country to say, well, here's a deliverable that we'd really like you to bring to the next summit. Um, do you need help? Can we cooperate? Is there, you know, do you, is there another country you'd like to work with? Does the IAEA have what they need to help you out to get to this point? Um, and so it provides a point of, of cooperation opportunity between countries. And that just, that helps generate trust. It helps generate, you know, the potential for additional cooperation beyond that. Um, and that, that, some of that transparency that comes with that is part of the assurance concept that, you know, that pushes back a little bit on that sovereignty point that you raised earlier. Um, and then obviously it's also a, a source for analysts and, you know, there's a lot of researchers who use this. And one of the things that NTI does is we make the whole back end available. Our massive database, our spreadsheet, you can download from the website and you can pick and choose pieces of that that you might incorporate into your own research, or you can play with the results because we weight results. We say, you know, some, some aspects are more important than others. If you differ with that judgment, you can play with the results and see if you come up with a different ranking that is meaningful. And so uh, we were really gratified when Third Way um, used the results, uh, some, of the, some of the results of our, of our report, some of the data in their um, report on the global marketplace for advanced nuclear reactors uh, and which countries might be, you know, quote unquote, more ready than others uh, to be, um, you know, to, to be interested in or ready to use these kinds of reactors. So we, that, that it's, a, it's a massive tool of data tool for the community uh, to really dig in. And I would invite any of the 111 participants that I see <laughs> listed on the screen to take a look at that data and see if it would be useful to you uh, in, your, uh, in your research and, and your work uh, as an official. I think it's a, um, I think in the, in the age of um, uh, more accelerated disinformation, um, as well as misinformation about complex topics, you know, the, the you know, honest mistakes as well as the more intentional um, diversions, it's really important to have um, some measurable things, you know, where you can just, here's, you know, we're not hiding, you know, it's not a magic uh, secret formula. Here's, here, we're showing our work. This is how it looks. You know, hey, Australia, you know, maybe gaming the system, but their points are going up. Um, uh, you can, you know, take it up with Australia. We're just happy. It's not about getting a grade. It's about making, um, making us all safer. And um, I think that in, you know, renewed great power competition, a lot of countries around the world are just like, just give me the facts, you know, <laughs> let us make our own decisions, but let's make our decisions based on facts and not uh, marketing or, you know, scare tactics. Um, Laura, what we, uh, we saw recently, um, our board member, Jill Ruby, and uh, your colleague, Deb Rosenblum, were both on, uh, had their confirmation hearing together at Armed Services Committee. And one of the topics that came up uh, and was hit pretty hard, there were two things that were hit pretty hard that I recall. One was, and you alluded to this, um, the, um, you know, the knowledge base. So a lot of people in our own National Nuclear Security Administration and, you know, in our um, you know, that, that whole ecosystem are nearing retirement age. And so there's a whole, you know, these are not, these are not things you just, you know, take a correspondence course and become, you know, expert at. So that's, that's number one. And is that, is that something that um, has uh, global implications? And the other thing that came up was the cyber threat, you know, the issues of, of cyber threat. And one of the, to go beyond nuclear, but related uh, one of the aspects of the energy grid, you know, all of these different kinds of things that can hook in uh, solar power, wind power, you know, smaller reactors that can contribute to, uh, you know, uh, reducing climate change and, 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 and go into the energy grid, also potentially open up the attack surface for cyber penetration. Um, was was were either of those issues on your agenda during your recommendations and proposals, you know, session at the uh, at the NSC, or have you given any thought to that in general? 
Well, the cyber issue when it comes to, you know, I kind of feel like for most aspects, cyber is like air. <laughs> it touches everything. We all, you know, every technology needs some aspect of cyber to function or to advance. Um, so I think there's just a whole rich set of like fundamental cybersecurity issues that apply to everything that, that is touching the cyber environment. Um, my, my colleagues at NTI, uh, Paige Stoutland and Aaron Dumbacher, have done a couple of really focused uh, studies that I will refer people to on the NTI uh, website, nti.org. Uh, one looking at the cyber risks associated with nuclear power plants and um, the, the specific aspects uh, that, that make that cyber nuclear power and nuclear energy uh, challenging or specific steps that are important there. The, the other thing that they've looked at is the intersection of cybersecurity and nuclear weapons command and control and the potential for uh, hacking or error uh, to be, uh, to create, you know, add to the risk of mistaken or accidental use uh, of nuclear weapons. And so I would refer people to those two studies. We, we have since the 19, I'm sorry, the 2016 Nuclear Security Index included a section on cyber uh, and, you know, initially as just a very like cursory look. And then we were able to dig a little deeper uh, into well, what are the actual indicators of having a good cyber, you know, at least some like aspects of cyber uh, security around nuclear materials uh, or nuclear facilities. Uh, and one of the key ga gauges is whether or not the, there are regulations in place for cybersecurity. And we found that even in the, the 2020 index that there, I, I think it was something like fewer than half of the countries uh, in the world that have nuclear materials or nuclear facilities have cybersecurity regulations. So clearly, we are lagging behind uh, as, as, a, as a global nuclear community in that. The International Atomic Energy Agency has spent a lot of time and energy in the last decade uh, building up um, the recommendations around cybersecurity in the nuclear context, nuclear energy and peaceful uses context. A lot of those are also applicable to, to nuclear security in a weapons context. And so there's... Um, there's a lot of, of attention and work that, that still needs to be done. And every time you know, we open the newspaper, it seems there's a new, a new reminder uh, of the creativity <laughs> uh, of, uh, and of the potential real world impact of nuclear, uh, of cybersecurity and, to, and including in the nuclear arena. Some may, some may recall that uh, there were hackers that, that got in, inside Ukraine's nuclear energy grid uh, and had the opportunity to interact with their, the power plants there, the nuclear power plants. And so this is, this is not um, science fiction. This is a science fact right now. Uh, I, 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 we've got a bunch of questions, great questions that are lined up. Um, and so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to resist the urge to continue to monopolize you. Um, but I do want to get to, if, they, if it doesn't come up organically, I do want to get to the gender champions uh, and just the kind of your philosophy on, you know, why we need to make sure that half the population is fully engaged in, in our, in our, uh, in these hard uh, problems. And also um, would love to cut, circle back uh, at some point and just hear about your path um, and what, you know, what prompted, I, we, we have a lot of young people on our staff, we have a lot of folks early in their careers, they look at a career like yours and think, oh my God, you know, I know it probably, you probably didn't have it all mapped out, you know, at the beginning. <laughs> Um, so we'd love to just hear a little bit about that from a mentorship kind of uh, perspective and, and what you think the next generation would be, um, you know, what would, would be doing. So anyway, let me turn it over to Nilsu for um, some questions from our audience. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Tom. So Dora, what I'm going to do is actually piggyback on Tom's uh, point about the importance of diversification in the workforce. 
and combine it with the impact of the pandemic, the impact on uh, the resilience of the human factor. If you could talk to us a little bit about the impact of the pandemic and how we can booster and diversify the security culture with a touch on uh, Tom's point about keeping an eye on the talent pipeline and also the importance of diversity. Okay, that's a big chunk of meaty topics there. Um, so the, um, I mean, there's, there's study after study that points out that diverse staffs have better outcomes, whatever your better is, whether it's uh, your, uh, you know, the profit uh, bottom line, or whether it's the durability of a peace agreement, or whether it's the uh, effectiveness of technology innovation. Um, you know, it's, it's just, um, you know, the more different perspectives, different lived experiences, different ways of approaching problems, um, different uh, approaches to collaboration uh, that can be brought to bear on big important problems, the more effective the solutions to those problems will be, the better buy-in you'll have to those solutions. So the even the perfect solution sometimes can't get executed because it's perceived as being imposed rather than, you know, developed in in uh, in consultation with those who are most affected. And so um, certainly, when it comes to nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, nuclear proliferation, these are huge, huge topics, and we. We are not going to get the best answers, as Tom said, if we leave half of the population outside of the conversation. Uh, so just from a, a pure effectiveness point of view, uh, setting aside the equity imperative from a moral uh, point of view, setting aside, well, not even setting aside, but recognizing the, that when these decisions go badly, it tends to be underrepresented communities that bear the burden of that, whether it's uh, pollution, uh, environmental damage associated with uranium mining uh, or the production of nuclear weapons materials, uh, whether it's the effects of an actual nuclear attack, uh, whether it's the um, you know application or the the how a, a national budget is built uh, that spends you know billions and trillions of dollars on on nuclear weapons uh, rather than other aspects that may contribute more effectively to human development. Uh, these are all ways in which the, uh, you know, those, those who have had less opportunity historically in, in our various societies uh, bear additional burden uh, from the choices that are made around nuclear energy and around nuclear weapons. And so they, they need to be part of that conversation. The, um, I think we've learned some interesting lessons in the pandemic that that are both hopeful and concerning. Um, one of the hopeful things is that we've learned that to be at the table, you don't necessarily have to be in the room. And so the, the, the remote work opportunities that have been perfected uh, in the, well, maybe not perfected, but certainly advanced and more common in the pandemic remind us that uh, we don't have to all be living in you know, an expensive city like Washington DC, dealing with a frustrating commute uh, and um, you know, challenges of, of childcare and or schools uh, to contribute. We, you know, people can live other places, they can work from a, a home environment uh, they, that may be more comfortable uh, from a, in terms of what other responsibilities they people have as you know humans and members of families and communities, and so I think that really expands the opportunity for uh, people who may not have felt that they're able uh, to uh, participate in the the nuclear policy conversation in the same you know in the way that we have historically undertaken it. Um, I also think, however, that, uh, I mean, I don't think I know uh, because we've just done a survey among gender champions. Well, it's interesting. We've done a survey across the nuclear policy community. About half of the respondents worked for gender champions, uh, for, for institutions where the president or the leader is a gender champion. About half of them didn't. And so we really saw a difference there. 
Um, but it's very clear that women have borne the brunt of some of the negative aspects of the pandemic, whether it's the uh, unequal uh, burdens of, of caregiving, uh, whether it's the uh, unequal, the, the, the pay gap uh, that occurs, uh, whether it's the, um, in some cases, the inability, you know, the, where the job that they, that they had might not be doable from a remote uh, point of view. And so that means that they've either had to uh, scale back hours or even may have been fired. Um, and the, that has occurred much more significantly in the nuclear policy field for women than for men. The, uh, the mental health effects uh, of, of the, all of the trauma of the pandemic uh, have uh, fallen disproportionately on women, uh, according to this survey. Uh, and the, you know, we're going to be publishing these results um, soon, but it's really remarkable um, how unevenly the effects of the pandemic have been, uh, the negative effects, both the negative and the positive effects of the pandemic have been distributed. So I think we've learned a couple different things about this. Um, the, um, and I think there's more, uh, more to be done. But I think this also points the way ahead as we think about pipeline. Um, you know, it's really, I'm just going to say it, the pipeline is, the, you know, the pipeline is not the problem. It's the retention that's the problem. How do we keep that pipeline from leaking? I mean, I see young women, I mean, NTI runs, in my view, one of the most impressive uh, uh, internship programs we have. We have between six and nine paid positions each semester. We get almost 300 applications for these. Um, and we, it's not hard at all for us to, you know, create a diverse, you know, to select a diverse class uh, from that group. The group is diverse. Our classes are diverse. Uh, women are interested, uh, you know, other underrepresented minorities are interested in this field. The question is, how do we get them in? And then how do we create opportunities for them to stay after that? Uh, either that first leap from an internship to a paid position or from a, a research position to something with more responsibility or more management skills. And then as people move on in their career, you know, how do we make it easier for women to move in and out of of career paths uh, with the childcare responsibilities that are, you know, currently so unevenly distributed. Um, you know, there's different solutions at every stage of that pipeline, and we need to be attentive to all of them. Um, but when it comes to education at the front end, you know, there's lots of people coming out of, of, of universities that are interested in either the policy side or the technical side of nuclear issues, and they are ready you know, to play a role uh, in these and it's organizations like CRDF and NTI and so many others that really have the responsibility to pull those people in. It's been, I've been actually shocked at how many uh, NNSA, National Nuclear Security Administration job fairs I've seen advertised. Um, they are definitely there to your point, Tom, ab about the, the pipeline or the, the workforce issues mentioned by uh, Jill Ruby and, and Deb Rosenblum. Um, you know they're out there looking for them. So the there are there are options out there, and we but we need to be more intentional about not just getting them in the door, but how do we keep them, you know, moving forward in their careers in a way that is, uh, you know, rewarding to them and beneficial uh, to the overall field. Keep going, Neil Sue. I will. Thank you very much, Laura. So um, you did mention earlier on the daily reminders that we received looking at the newspaper and our participants also pointed to the increased number of incidents where we uh, read reports of theft of nuclear material. And you also pointed to the CPPNM as being the only legally binding international mechanism. So combining mm -hmm. those two aspects, what are some of the biggest impediments for countries to sign up to the CPPNM? And I know NTI has an extensive study on what next steps should be um, in terms of securing the uh, nuclear materials. Um, yeah, so it's, um, when it comes to the, the ratification and implementation of the CPPNM, um, I think it's uh, gotten to the Point that a lot of a lot of those who have not yet done so don't see how why it matters to them. 
Um, they may be countries that don't that don't have any nuclear materials at all. Um, they may be countries that are not looking uh, to be part of the peaceful nuclear energy uh, activities. And so helping them understand that, that there are other aspects of the CPP, CPPNM than simply the physical protection of the materials and facilities on one's territory or during transportation. There's a whole set of requirements um, and commitments surrounding criminalization. And this really goes to the point about um, uh, you know, materials that have been stolen uh, or transported um, to, to, to point out that there needs, you, each, every single country needs to criminalize nuclear smuggling, needs to train their, their, uh, their law enforcement and customs and other officials to be able to identify and interdict and then prosecute uh, and then act, um, you know, adequately sentence <laughs> of nuclear smugglers. And this is a, um, a global responsibility the, uh, because we, we don't know where materials are gonna end up uh, on their path from where they might have been taken from to where they might be made into some kind of a malicious device to where they might be detonated or or used and distributed in some way, um, so there's this really is a global responsibility, and that's why universalization of the CPPNM is so important. Um, the uh, other aspects that that we think are critical is that the the one of the requirements that of the CPPNM, the only thing that is really that every single country absolutely has to do is to provide the International Atomic Energy Agency with information about what laws and regulations they use to implement that treaty. That's Article 14 uh, in the treaty. It, it applies to everybody. And whether those are nuclear security regulations or whether they're criminalization rules or whatever, um, the, each country that's a member you know, that is a state party is required to provide that information. Um, it was my honor when I was ambassador to carry out that role in connection with the, the amended treaty, uh, which obviously had much more, uh, many more requirements. The United States ratified it in 2015, but um, it, took, <laughs> it took almost two years to compile and I provided two binders this big with, a, with uh, the printed uh, laws and regulations that we use. Not every country has to do that. It, it might just be a list of the laws or a set of hyperlinks to the laws uh, and regulations that you have. So um, we were kind of trying to make a point uh, by having a very strong visual, um, but there are a lot of less burdensome ways to the countries can comply with their Article 14 uh, requirements. Thank you, Laura. And the final word from the participants before I turn it over to Tom would be the IAEA approach for advanced reactor designs, whether you foresee any major changes to the verification mechanisms and uh, the milestones documents that the IAEA will provide in response to emerging technologies such as small modular reactors. Well, I saw in from, from glancing in the Q&A that the IAEA is in the process of adjusting and updating its milestones documents uh, for these new reactor types. So I think that's great. I haven't seen any of the documentation, so I'm not in a position to discuss its adequacy, but certainly there are issues that will be different um, in terms of how countries prepare to, to address these. Um, when it comes to safeguards verification, there's going to be a lot of differences. Um, some of the, so, I mean, let's just think about what's the baseline now. For the vast majority of nuclear power plants, um, their large gigawatt scale, there is, they use 5% or less enrichment. Um, the fuel elements are huge and require special equipment uh, to move them. And there's a lot of, uh, and, and, and the reactors have to be shut down every 18 months to two years to refuel them. So there's a lot of history of how those are safeguarded and it's extremely well understood. Um, similarly for enrichment plants and for uh, those limited number of countries which, you know, that who are not weapon states that uh, have reprocessing plants. Um, the, 
these new reactors are different in many ways uh, from a safeguards perspective. Some of them, the fuel is the size of a billiard ball. Uh, so how do you do, is that item accountability or is it a flow as these move constantly within the reactors? That's a new safeguards question. Um, some, of the, uh, some of these reactors have a sealed core with a fuel that's likely to last for, for 10 years or more. Um, that means refueling is not going to be an, uh, is not the opportunity, uh, not necessarily the opportunity that the IAEA has to look inside the core and see what's going on. And so you're going to need to have new ways for the IAEA to have visibility on what's happening inside that core in order to understand how the material is transforming. Some of these new, uh, new designs have liquid fuel. I mean, this one is, I think, probably the most challenging one because the fuel is mixed with a moderator and it's and it's melted. Um, you know, so you need <laughs> uh, and, and the and the the fuel, the fissile material is not going to be uniformly dispersed within this pool of of melted uh, of melted uh, moderator. And so the there's a lot of research and development that needs to be done in terms of making sure that there is no diversion from a facility like that. Fortunately, that's not one of the most early ones uh, that's going to be looked at. Some of these are really tiny, um, you know, a kilogram of material, uh, which, you know, does that, how does that fit with things like the small quantities protocol? <laughs> um, and so there's, there's those questions. And then, of course, there's questions of the new, of, of higher enrichment, still low enriched, but, it, you know, the, the reference is high assay low and rich. So something between 10% and 19% instead of 5%. So if you, if you understand um, enrichment, then you know that the vast majority of the effort it takes to enrich to weapons usable uranium, high enriched uranium, which is like in the 90% or 80% realm, the vast majority of the work and the time happens in those early uh, in, in those lower enrichments. So the amount of time it will take to, if you, if there was a diversion of high assay, low enriched uranium in a country that had either a, a, an open or a clandestine enrichment capacity that would take, you know, significantly shorter time for that country to go from 19% to 90%. Uh, and so how do you think about significant quantity? In other words, the amount of diversion that the IAEA needs to be able to detect within a particular give, uh, period of time. How do you think about that issue of timeliness uh, of detection of diversion when you think about the shortness of time that it could take to go from you know, a non-weapons usable material to a weapons usable material? So these all require research and development, maybe development of new, uh, new actual devices or, uh, or safeguards techniques. Um, and oh, and the other, the other issue is mobile reactors. <laughs> you know, and some of them may be sealed reactors. So now you've got a sealed uh, fuel, uh, you know, a sealed reactor core moving by ship or by rail or by air across national borders. Um, you taught, you're thinking about perhaps US military owning reactors that are deployed in other countries. Um, what does that mean for safeguards in that country, if it's a country that is, you know, susceptible to safeguards because the U.S. is not required to do safeguards. So there's just all of this stuff that, that, that in that case, that's more of a policy and a legal question than it is a technical question. And so we as a community, a nuclear policy and technical community, I think, uh, need to be farther ahead than we are in actually thinking through what are the revisions to national regulations, international export requirements, safeguards characteristics, deployment judgments, um, the, how the U.S. does one, two, three agreements, agreements for nuclear cooperation, what, are the component, how, what role does that tool play in bounding the, the risks associated with these new reactors. So, there's a lot uh, of, of questions still to be resolved and, and, uh, at, and at, in an international context, right? These aren't just what does the US think are the right answers here. You know, what do the, 
170 some odd members of the IAEA think about these things. So lots of lots of work to do. So many, so many topics that, and, and we are at time, but um, you know, you've, you've really, uh, you've given some, I think, uh, some confidence in, um, as I said earlier, that there are folks in the, in the mix who are sweating the details and thinking about the relationships and doing it all with the, ex the understanding that uh, sustainable solutions have to meet various interests. Um, one of the, just a pitch uh, and, a, and a plug for organizations like NTI and CRDF Global. And, you know, I love the market and the market dynamics and it's a powerful engine, but the market, you know, is gonna push in one direction. Um, national security arms races, you know, national security concerns are gonna push in a direction. And having some organizations that aren't trying to sell something, and aren't trying to, you know, win something, you know, specifically, um, <clears throat> that are really, uh, you know, have a strong, you know, belief in internationalism and international collaboration, as well as, you know, individual country, you know, priorities and rights. Um, there's a place for us, and as the technology, it's most of the uh, most of the issues that you raised. There's not a technology solution. In fact, the changing technology requires the process solution and the policy solutions to be more agile and adaptive. Um, uh, next time, Laura, I want to start with what you would tell the um, the high school girl in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, of who's thinking about a career in international. So we'll, we'll just have to uh, we'll have to get you back sometime and and uh, and really focus on that. But on behalf of uh, all of us at CRDF Global and all of the uh, folks, thank you. Uh, Laura, for joining us today. Thank you all for attending, for tuning in, and um, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Tom. It's, and thank you, Nilsu. Thank you, Ken. It's been a really fun morning, and uh, I look forward to continuing to, to work closely with the great CRDF organization. Bye, all.